Okay, this is Chapter 1, Assessment Introduction. Okay, first of all, um, we'll be discussing response to intervention throughout all of the chapters, and so you're, you're just going to see this. This is going to be a theme throughout all of, all of the lectures. RTI is a process that we use um, to make sure that we're using research-based interventions. Now, a lot of times we have interventions that have not been research-based. And how, how do you know if it's research-based? Well, generally speaking, your district is going to have a list of interventions that have been found to be researched and very effective with students. And those are the ones that you're most likely going to be using. Sometimes, and, and we use RTI because sometimes students have um, different needs that require additional or different types of assessments or instruction. And this, generally speaking, we're looking at 3 to 5% of our population. So it's not a big percentage. In, in the whole scheme of things when you look at a hundred percent but it is significant when you realize of how many students are out there that are actually needing help so three to five percent of a hundred we're only talking about three to five students but when you're talking about on a much grander scale of say a thousand students or a hundred thousand students that number starts piling up rather, rather quickly and so this is why it is so important so one of the issues talked about in this chapter were the legalities of assessment now there's a lot of information in this um, in in this chapter so I've only picked out the things that I think are the most important or that I want to focus or that I think we need a specific focus on. So the IDEA 2004 and NCLB from 2001, they really placed a lot more emphasis on the assessment of students so that we could help them to attain the standards of the various states. Now, students with exceptionalities, they're now required to take statewide or if they are unable to take the statewide test, they, they have to take an alternative exam. And this is how we're measuring progress within the general education curriculum. So we have to make decisions about the type of evaluations, the tests and accommodations that might be needed in order for those students to take the statewide test. So how do we go about doing that? Well, or deciding who's going to take the regular test or who's going to take the alternative test? Well, the federal government has helped us to do that. They've decided that only 2% of all students should be taking an alternative test. Now this goes, depending on your administration, from 1% to 2%. Uh, they, they're never going to allow more than 2% to be taking the alternative tests. Now, alternative tests, this can be um, anything on a wide continuum um, from a normative test. So they might, be, they might ask the school psychologist to come in and test the student just for this particular purpose. Um, so they might be given a whisk. Um, if they need to be tested one-on-one -on -one, and they know that they cannot com complete that test within the confines of the classroom of general curriculum. They might give them a brigance. The, the, the classroom teacher is, is quite capable of doing that. Um, so we might, you, we might say, you know, why don't let's give them a key math um, and a Woodcock reading mastery inventory. Uh, we can shore that up with uh, an, uh, an IRI um, or, you know, an, a reading inventory. We can also use some math inventories or, or timed um, probes so that we can show this. And, you know, we also might want to put in a CBM that they've been, they've been using in, in class 
which those all of those are alternative types of testing that the federal government will use because they are all accepted and um, researched types of its uh, of assessment so then we need to think about our inclusion students inclusion students very rarely take the alternative um, route the the most alternative that you're going to find is maybe a one-on-one -on -one test they're given the test that everybody else takes but they're just giving it um, in a small group or one-on-one -on -one, one student one teacher now um, and, and the, the general education classroom setting has increased to more than 52%. This is going to continue to increase, and actually I think 52% is probably a rather low estimate of how many of our students with special needs are in inclusion classes. I think it's actually much higher. Uh, because many of our students say they have Asperger's. Well, those students um, many of them are in inclusion classrooms even though they are technically um, seen as being having a severe disability area so um, disability areas can be severe they can be mild depending on the severity of the disability although the federal government looks at severity within the disability area that doesn't always it doesn't always pan out that way so we need to look at the number of students that are receiving special education support that is also increasing but so is the number of students who graduate with regular diplomas um, for the most part most students uh, certainly more than 54.5 should be uh, graduating with a regular diploma so whenever you are a case manager especially those of you that are going in secondary um, or that will um, in in some way be uh, working with from from the elementary standpoint with the secondary um, folks then you guys really need to think about let's see if this student can do a regular diploma we can always pull them back but if you start out with the idea that this child is not going to be able to be successful then we set up the child for failure and this all comes down to educational accountability so when we are working towards improving education we want to be sure that we're looking at this from the cultural linguistic and ethnic and ethnic um, diversity realm now you might think oh culturally and ethnically that's kind of the same thing isn't it it's not really because everyone in our class has um, a certain culture that they live within you know it's not the same for each and every person every every home has its own rules so therefore every home has its own culture because that's really what culture is it is a set of rules that individuals live by individuals that are living together so you might have a classroom culture and you can go through different classrooms and each of those classrooms are going to have its own culture you're going to know who the leaders are and who the followers are and so this, this is what we're talking about it's not just the cultural sense in ethnic diversity it's a cultural sense of the holistic realm of every of all of the students in your classroom so we need to be sensitive to all of that then federal regulations also require that we have procedures and funding to address the disproportionate number of students from different ethnic groups who happen to be eligible for special education now some so this is an area that we have to be very careful of because we want to make sure that our all of our students who need the services 
are receiving it. But we should never be giving services based on a language barrier. I'm not saying language impairment, a language barrier. Just because they don't have um, full command of the English language does not mean that they have a language impairment. They might, but then again, most likely they probably don't, and we're overlooking uh, other aspects. Now, this could also ha uh, have come to bear on behaviors. We can't give services to a student based on behaviors that are normal in their culture, but may not be normal in someone else's culture. For example, talking very loudly. In some homes and in some cultures, it's considered to be very normal. Um, you know, space, personal space issues. Depending on the culture that a student is from, they may not really know how to interact with other students. That doesn't mean they have an emotional disorder. That just means they need to know what the rules are. For example, if a student um, moves into a school district, into a school zone, and they are from Brazil. Brazil um, has very low un, um, expectations of personal space. Brazilians tend to get very close to one another. Um, when they're talking to one another, they could have their faces right, you know, so close that their cheeks might be touching. Now, in the United States, that's considered to be very rude um, and infringing upon another's space. So this is one of those areas that you really have to help students understand, okay, these are the rules in this area. And so sometimes it may, you may feel like they are uh, proverbially getting in your face when they're really not meaning it in the same way that we might take that. So getting close, that's what they do when they want to talk to somebody and they're very buddy-buddy with them. Um, but... To, because to keep somebody apart is considered to be very rude in that culture. So you need to know what the rules of the cultures are in your classroom so that you can help acclimatize everyone to a classroom culture. So then we need to look at disproportionality. One of the problems with disproportionality is often we have students in... Um, say, emotional dis disturbance, um, mental retardation, or intellectual disability, as it's now called. Those two areas in particular ha have a uh, propensity to be disproportionate with ethnicity. So we have a much higher number of students coming into um, those those particular two areas from uh, Hispanic and African American um, backgrounds than we do of of Anglo or white backgrounds, and many times it has to do with cultural behaviors. Um, so we have very disproportionate. You know, if we have a um, percentage of African American of nineteen percent. We should never go over that, although many times we do. We need to be able to explain those disproportionalities. And that leads to overrepresentation, which they're very closely linked. Now, I have a graph here, and it's also in your book, of the um, disability by ethnicity. So, um, when you consider that American Indian, looking at learning disabilities straight up here on the top, we do not have 53% of our population as being American Indian. Now, many of us have American Indian um, heritage in our families. However, we don't list ourselves that way on our tax return um, because we don't fit the qualifications. So, though, however, we, 
we actually have more white non-Hispanic individuals in this country and in our schools than we do of any of these other areas. But let's look at these different um, percentages. Now, if 53% of the American Indian population has a learning disability, however, that th those numbers do not um, compare favorably to the um, American Indian population or the Native American population to the white non-Hispanic population, uh, th those are actually very, very different. And so they, they don't come together evenly. And so we, we need to um, be sure when we're looking at, at, at students that we're actually referring them for testing and we're assessing students based on fact, not on supposition. So, other cultural considerations. We have disproportionality. Um, so this has to do with the occurrence of how many students come from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And we need to rely not on clinical judgment, or we need to use clinical judgment, but we don't need that to be our only um, uh, deciding factor. We need to make sure that we can shore that up with uh, experiential facts, something that we have seen, something that we have observed, um, information that we can show on paper. So then many times students from homes that fall into the range of poverty. And, and these generally we look at, oh, it's a single parent. It's an increased risk for disability. Now that may be true, but there are a lot of single parent families that we don't see that incidence. However, why do we look at single parent families? Because number one, they tend to uh, be more poverty driven and on top of that the parents tend to have less time to spend with those children helping them in school so we need to make sure of what it is that we're actually looking at we also have an increased risk of disability in environments that lack the resources and support often again with single parent families because most single parent families are headed by uh, the mother. And so when we think about that, women traditionally have made less money. They have uh, traditionally fewer resources. And so many of these children do not have quality health care because the mother does not have a job that earns that kind of health care. And then we also have to look at those learned behaviors and identities that we typically associate with school. So if students are doing poorly in school, they tend to have a lower self-esteem. So we need to help them to know what their abilities are and to help them to achieve within their ability range. So then we want to look at assessment in practice. So what are what kinds of assessment um, practices are we going to be uh, do do we do in the classrooms so all assessment practices must adhere to legal mandates okay federal law comes first now state law can um, build on top of it but they cannot take away from federal law so for example federal law states that in order for a student to be um, given the designation of gifted, they must have an IQ of 130. The state cannot come in and say, oh, we've decided that that IQ range has to be 135. They can't do that. They also um, can't, they, they, can, they can make a designation of saying, well, you know, we know that there were some cultural issues here, there's some poverty going on, so we're going to accept one, 125. 
for certain students. They can do that. Um, but they cannot raise that IQ uh, limitation. There are certain areas that they cannot change. And so we need to remember that everything has to agree with the federal government first. We also need to make sure that we're adhering to ethical standards. So we're doing what's right for kids, not just easy for ourselves or for our school district. And we need to remember that we go along with the basic principles of measurement. Now there are a lot of individuals who um, don't like assessment. They um, don't believe that uh, assessing students is a good thing to do. However, at the moment, that's what we have. That's the best program that we have to work with. And so we have to adhere to the principles that we know that work. So then we have school systems and state education agencies. The state education agency is known as the SEA, and you will get to know this. The state education agency, or SEA, or local education agency, or LEA. You're going to see this throughout all of your documentation, IEPs, and um, a lot of articles. So when, when you see those, that, that's what they're talking about. And these agencies are required to collect data to document student achievement. Just like your artifacts, which we are collecting data to document your achievement, school districts have to do the same thing with their testing. We also have to use pre-referral interventions that are intended to address bias in the referral process. So just because you want to get a kid out of your class, we cannot ask for a test. And you may laugh, but it happens. I once had a, a teacher who wanted to know when I was going to get to testing this little guy. And I, you know, gave her, you know, the date that I was supposed to test him on. And she says, so when, it, when are you going to get him out of my room? And I said, um, we aren't taking him out of your room. We're going to find out if he requires services, number one. And number two, we're going to give recommendations for your classroom. But he won't be leaving your classroom. And she became very upset with me. And I said, where am I going to put him? I mean, he's the you know, th this is unfair to him. He needs to be with the general ed curriculum. And we don't have, you know, a specific classroom where I would put him. So no, he will not be leaving the classroom. It is very unfair for students who need to learn proper behavior and proper um, academics to move them out of the general education classroom into another classroom just because sometimes they can be difficult to work with and because they need those experiences in order to grow. Okay, we have some historical and contemporary models of assessment and we need to go over this so that you can have a good understanding of where we've been and hopefully where we're going. So the historical model, the teacher noticed the student was having difficulties. The, the, there were specific deficits that appeared to be the cause of their difficulty. They identified those and named them. The student was referred to a, a multidisciplinary team, hopefully. Often it was just given to the school psych and they, they were supposed to figure it all out. Eligibility was determined. An IEP was put in place and generally they were taken out of the classroom. So many times some of the outcomes were that we had students that were being referred for assessment and receiving special education services outside of the general education classroom. But the contemporary model, we are emphasizing finding a solution rather than determining eligibility. That is what RTI is all about. We are looking for various methods of interventions and assessments that are utilized to document before referral. So the referral is actually the last step now. 
not one of the first steps. And interventions may or may not include special education services. They may be given a 504 plan instead. They may not qualify for any special education services, in which case the classroom teacher should still get recommendations for that classroom. So here we have the historical model, general education instruction, student is not progressing as, ex as ex expected, the student is referred to multidisciplinary team or the evaluator, the assessment is completed, and then the IEP team determines if the student is eligible for services. And this is very important. This is still the same. The IEP team is always the one who determines if the student is eligible for those services. Now, the evaluator will state, there will be a statement on the end of the evaluation saying, um, Johnny appears to meet the qualification for said disability area according to um, Special Education Law 300.001. And basically what, what they're saying is, I've already looked this up, he appears to qualify, but the IEP team is the one who actually determines that qualification by law. So then we need to look at early intervening services. So we want to address the student's needs within the Gen Ed classroom to prevent additional assessment. So assessment is not our end all. This is what we do when we don't know what else to do. And we need to gather data, gather information so that we can come up with a plan. So just as your, your CBM is your plan for perhaps carrying out classroom instruction, the IEP is the plan for carrying out the continuum of instruction. But in order to have that, we have to do assessment. But before we do assessment, we want to address that student's needs to the best of our ability. Then we want to use research-based practices and document, document, document. If you don't write it down, it didn't happen. That's why a CBM is so important. Because to all um, assessment, if we have a CBM, everything is documented on there. We have dates. We have um, the information of what kind of intervention was given. And then on top of that, we have, um, you know, how the student um, responded to those interventions. So all of these might be included in your RTI methodology.